scripture reading tonight will come from Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. If you'd like to turn there, Galatians 2, verse 20. I'll try to refrain from not singing it. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Good evening. It's good to see you tonight. Hope that you have had a good day and glad that we can be back together uh, with one another to worship God and to study His Word uh, this evening. I want to make sure and remind everyone, of course, about next Sunday, uh, our Congregational Evangelism Lab uh, on Sunday morning uh, at 930. We'll have Bible class and everybody 6th through 12th grade and up is, is uh, or 6th grade and up uh, is encouraged to come and be here. You won't have a, a high school class next week, so uh, teens, make sure that you're upstairs uh, with us uh, as we talk about some opportunities we have for evangelism, our sermon for Sunday morning worship will also be about evangelism. We'll have lunch and then starting at 1 o'clock until about 4.30 we'll have our afternoon sessions and we will not have a 6 o'clock service next Sunday night. So make sure that you remember that. Uh, if you are here, we'll figure it out. Uh, but most of us are going to be here between uh, 1 o'clock and 4.30. So please make sure that you are here for that uh, and that you are a part of that. Again, sign up if you certainly if you plan to be here for lunch. But really if you're planning for being here any part of that day uh, please let us know so we can just be prepared. And we'd love to, to be a part of that. Again, if you want to be uh, better, if you want to have some practice, if you want to learn some more, be reminded of things you already know about teaching people about God, please don't miss next, next Sunday. Uh, be here for every part of it if you can. Uh, it will be a blessing to you. Uh, we've put a good bit of work into it already. i uh, got some people who have uh, prepared some special presentations and certainly hope that you will come and uh, appreciate them and the work that they've put into that. Growing up as a child in the uh, late 80s and early 90s, one of my favorite television shows was American Gladiators. I love that show. I loved especially the end uh, when uh, there would be the, the champions uh, on the, uh, the tennis ball gun. Man, I, if only I could get one of those things. I, I would love to have that tennis ball gun as the competitors were trying to uh, make it through the obstacle course and uh, make it to, to whatever the final goal was. I don't necessarily even remember. I think it was maybe shooting the, uh, the, the gun itself, but uh, the, 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 the champions would beat up there and they'd be ripped and they'd have all their muscles out, but they'd be shooting tennis balls at people, something that kids would do in, in your backyard. I love that show growing up. Uh, in more recent years, I love another show uh, that, that has been popular on television. Perhaps you've seen it, uh, American Ninja Warrior. Uh, it's another show, not quite the same. You don't really have any competitors that, that are trying to stop you, but it's, a, it's definitely an obstacle course, and there, there are some feats of agility that are necessary. There are some feats of, of pretty intense strength and upper body strength especially that are necessary uh, to make it through this obstacle course and to, to make it to the end. Another show that I liked growing up, not nearly as intense, uh, really pretty boring. You probably wouldn't want to watch it, uh, but I found it fascinating. Uh, on ESPN or, or one of those sports channels, they, they would show the, the Ironman Triathlon. I loved watching the coverage of the Ironman Triathlon. Now you say, Andy, why? That's a good question. Uh, I, I don't know, but, but I loved watching it. 2.4 miles of swimming. Uh, 122 miles of bike riding ended with 26.2 miles of running. A, a triathlon with, with no break in between. But, but they somehow, their producers, their, their directors, their, their idea people, they found a way to, to make seeing this man out in the middle of the desert or out in the middle of the, the wilderness of, I think it was Hawaii, you know, so it was, it was a pretty surrounding. But out in the middle of nowhere, this guy just running down the road. There he goes. <laughs> Hour later, huh, he's still running. There he goes. But somehow they, they made that so compelling to me. And I think part of it was, was of course, the, the personal stories that they were able to bring in, that, the, the hard training that that person uh, put into the, the preparation for this, this triathlon. I'm sure they did many other triathlons in order to prepare for it. But I, I found that so compelling. In more recent years, and in, in similar, if not the Iron Man, uh, they, there have been stories about how dads would, would push their, their children that were in wheelchairs 
wheelchairs and, and could never do something like that. And, and even somehow, I, I believe they, they put the child in a, uh, you know, the child that's, you know, a little bit older now, maybe a teenager or maybe even a full-grown adult, they, they put him into a, a raft and he would swim that 2.4 miles pulling his, his child behind him. And he'd have a, a special bike for that uh, 122 miles where the, the child would, would sit in the bike and would ride along with him. I, I love stories like that. And, and I, I, just, I just really enjoyed, especially as a, a teenager, when those shows would come on and, and probably my mom and dad would walk into the room and say, what are you watching? Why are, why are you watching that? Isn't baseball on or something like that? But, but I really just found those stories compelling. You know, the Christian life is like a triathlon, isn't it? It's an endurance race. It's not a sprint. Uh, today, this morning, uh, we know that there are members here who are struggling, perhaps even struggling with their faith. Certainly their faith is being tested through the loss of loved ones or through loss of job or through difficulty at work or difficulty at home. Uh, I know that there are, are, are people here today that are, that are visiting with us uh, that have expressed the fact that they, they felt the need to, to come and, and to be back with God or back with God's people. I, I don't know all the background of that, but I imagine the reason that any of us feel that way is because things aren't going quite right. Things are difficult. Life is not easy. And we realize that, don't we? Uh, we, we recognize that, that we have trials, we have tribulations, we have difficulty. And, and, and all of those things sometimes, perhaps many times, will test our faith. I even had one member who came into my office this week, or perhaps it was the end of last week, and, and she asked me simply, Do you ever find Christianity hard? You know what I had to say? Absolutely. Sometimes being a faithful Christian to God is difficult. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 3. We had a uh, men's uh, prayer breakfast and devotional yesterday, and we, we spent a good bit of time in Philippians chapters 3 and 4. And I want to review some of the things we talked about, really just walk through a good portion of Philippians chapter 3 and 4 uh, as we talk about some, some things that hopefully will be uh, encouraging to you uh, if you're going through difficulty, or at least will be a good reminder for you even if things are, are going well right now. But before we get there, I want to reference a couple of other passages. When we think about the difficulty of Christianity, did, did Jesus know that following Him would be difficult? He did. Did Jesus tell people that following me is going to be difficult? Yeah, he, he made it abundantly clear. Over in Luke chapter 14, it tells us there in verse 25 and following that, that large crowds, lo lots of people are following Jesus. Now, you think about it maybe for you. If, if you want to have influence on people's lives, if you want people to listen to you, if you want people to, to hear what you have to say, and there are large crowds following you, logic, reasoning, Rationale might say you're not going to tell them, hey, following me is going to be really, really tough. And if you're going to follow me, you've got to forsake everything else. But that's exactly what Jesus did. He starts out in verse 25 and he tells them uh, in, in that passage there that if you're going to follow me, you've got to place me above all other things. And he says it in an extremely difficult way. If you don't hate your mother, if you don't hate your father, if you don't hate your brother, if you don't hate your sister, if you don't hate your children, you can't be my follower. Now, that's a, a radical statement. That's a statement that, that gets your attention. And, and for some people in that large crowd, you know what it did? It turned them off completely to Jesus in that instance. And they probably walked away. They probably said, hey, hate my family. What are you talking about? No way. I'm not going to listen to you and, and disregard my family. I can't do that. And that, that's, that's a situation that maybe when we hear those words, if we don't think about what, what the context is, is, what the point Jesus is trying to get across is, that, that could be a reaction that we might have. Really the point that Jesus is trying to make that, that we must forsake all others in an effort to follow Jesus. And any time anyone or anything or any situation or circumstance is in conflict with Jesus, we always, we always, we always choose Jesus. Every time. Because we're dedicated to Him. Because like Kevin said in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, that's a really easy verse to sing. Is nice and peppy and, and it's ready to go and, and you can you can sing that I've been crucified with and we can we can just sing that and and it can be so so in, such an encouraging song to sing but if you if you stop and think about what those words are saying that's not a that's not a peppy message that's not an encouraging message I've been crucified I, I have died with Christ and this life that I now live is no longer about me it's about Jesus and the reason it's about Jesus is because He loved me and He gave Himself to die for me. You know, the, the idea of 
watching the Iron Man triathlon or even watching American Ninja Warrior or American Gladiators, that's one thing. But the idea of participating in those, now you may say, okay, Gladiators, got that, all right, I got that. Even maybe Ninja Warrior, hey, I'll give it a shot, but then Iron Man, count me out. I'll watch it and I'll enjoy watching it. I like riding a bike, but not for 122 miles. I can swim okay, not for 2.4 miles in the middle of the ocean. Uh, I ain't running anywhere close to however long that was. Uh, I'll watch it, and I'll enjoy it. And it'll be something that, that I, you know, if, if it was on right now or, you know, when I get home, I, I turn it on, and I'd, I'd spend some time watching it. There's a big difference between watching something and participating in something. Galatians 2.20 tells us that we're not just watching Jesus be our example. Galatians 2.20 says, no, I'm, I'm going to live that kind of life. I'm going to do that. I'm going to be that kind of person. In Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through 37, Jesus again tells another large crowd that's following him that it, whoever wishes to follow him must deny himself, pick up his cross daily, and follow after me. Deny yourself. Don't do what you want to do. Pick up your cross. What is the cross? It's a mechanism of death. Again, die to yourself and follow after. Live like Jesus. And then it goes on to say right after those verses, for if you gain the whole world but lose your soul, you've made a bad deal. If you gain the whole world, all the riches, all the glory, all the honor, all the fame, all the people doing what you want them to do, but you lose your soul, you forfeit your soul, then you've made a bad deal. And because of that, life in general is difficult. You go outside and you ask people today just, just on the street, hey, how's life going? A lot of people are going to say, man, I'm dealing with some pretty serious stuff. It's pretty tough for me. And, and that's true for everyone. But for those of us who, who name the name of Christ, who, who call Him our Lord and our Savior, and say to Him, I'll deny myself and I'll pick up my cross every single day and I'll follow you, that's not easy. And that's when we get to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, as Paul is wrapping up his thoughts in this book in the last couple of chapters, he says, finally, here's, here's the last thing that I want to tell you, my brethren. Rejoice in the Lord. It's important that we know what's going on here. The book of Philippians is written to Paul because the Philippian church sends a man, if you go up just a few verses in verse 25 of chapter 2, named Ephroditus, they, they send him to Paul while he's in prison in Rome. And what did Paul just say? Rejoice in the Lord. And what, is it, what does he go on to say? To write the same thing again, that's no trouble for me. It's, it, it, it's not a problem. Yes, I'm in prison. And yes, they, they knew about all the things that, that Paul had experienced in his life and in his faith. But he says, it's easy for me to rejoice in the Lord. And, and what we want to see here is, we want to be like that, don't we? Despite the circumstances of our life, despite the things that you're going through tonight, you can find joy in God. You may not find joy in your circumstances. You may not find joy in what you're going through. But you can find joy in the midst of that in the Lord. Paul is in prison because of his faith, and he's still able to find joy. And notice what else he says. It's no, not a trouble for me, and it's a safeguard for you. If, if the Philippians would learn this lesson, that you can find joy in the midst of trial, it would safeguard their souls. And the same thing's true for us. If we can learn the lesson and apply it, that we can find joy in the midst of difficulty, it'll help save us. It'll help keep our souls safe. Verse 2 says, Beware of the dogs, beware of the evildoers, beware of those of the false circumcision. For we are of the true circ circumcision, whose worship the Spirit of God and the glory of Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. Now that's that, that last phrase there, no confidence in the flesh, that's, that's an extremely important thing. Uh, Paul's going to go on in verses 4, 5, and 6, and he's going to say, But if anybody could have confidence in the flesh... Paul would say, I, I'm the man. I, I could have confidence in the flesh. Look, look at who I am. Look at my lineage. Look at the things that I've done. Look at my zeal. Look at, look at all the things that I've done in my life. If anybody could have confidence in the flesh, Paul says, I could. Look at the things that I've done in my life. Look at who I am. Look at where I come from. I could have confidence in the flesh. But he says, the reason we have hope, the reason we have glory, the reason he, we can have joy in despite of our circumstances is not because of our flesh. Instead, it's because of our faith. It's because, not because of what we can accomplish, but because we believe in a God who can accomplish anything. And that's why we can have joy. That's why we can have hope. Skip down to verse 7. 
He says after saying all those things that, that could be beneficial to him in a, in a physical sense, but of whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. What's he saying there? He, he's repeating in essence the words of Jesus in, in Mark chapter 8. If you gain the whole world but lose your soul... You've made a bad deal. If you give up the whole world, but you gain Christ, you've made a good deal. That's what Paul is saying here. He says, I've given up everything. I, I won't have it. If something gets in the way of my relationship with Jesus, it's not in my life. It's not there. I've counted all things as loss. I'd give them all up. Listen, there's a question for us. That's difficult, isn't it? What if something's beneficial to you? What if something's good for you in your life? If you were able to realize the fact that it was getting in the way of your relationship with God, would you remove it from your life? Paul says he would. The endurance racer must say that he would. Uh, the Christian that's running this long distance race, we've got to get rid of everything that gets in our way and make sure that we simply run the race that is set before us, as Hebrews tells us. We're going on down to verse uh, 14. I pressed on to the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Uh, go back to verse 12. I need to read that. Not that I have already obtained it, this, this resurrection from the dead, this hope that we have of, of heaven. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I was also laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, he says, I do not regard myself as, as laying hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, then verse 14, I press on to the goal, toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. If you want to turn over to Hebrews chapter 12, you can, you can look at that. And, and Hebrews 12, the, the writer of Hebrews, again echoes this same sentiment and, and says we see this in Christ. Uh, after chapter 11, the Hall of Fame of Faith. Look at all these faithful people. Look at all the, the men and women of the Old Testament and the great things that they were able to do. And, and why were they able to do that? Not because of their flesh. Remember, that's what Philippians says. No confidence in the flesh. Not because of, of anything they could do, but because of, because of what God did through them. Because of the faith they had in a God that can accomplish anything. And he says in chapter 12 of Hebrews, after mentioning all these people, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, since we see all of these examples of people being faithful to God, let us also run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And listen to this. Who for the joy set before Him endured the cross and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Why did Jesus go to the cross? Yesterday in our, in our, our devotional for the, the men, for those of, uh, those of us who were there, we talked about uh, the, the clear fact that Jesus did not want to die on the cross. In the garden, he prays three times, each time in agony. Uh, one time to the point where his, his sweat drops became like blood. Perhaps he bled from his head. His, his prayer was so intense. God, Father, if there's any other way, if we, can, if we can do this another way, let's do it another way. Let's find a different way. God, I, I know what this is going to be like. It's going to be painful. It's going to be, it's going to be agonizing, not only physically, but he understood the spiritual agony that he would be going through, taking on the sins of all mankind, a, a sinless, perfect man who had never sinned in his entire life, and yet he takes on all the sin. He, he knew the physical pain, and he knew the spiritual pain that was headed his way. But what does Hebrews tell us? Why did he do it? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. What was the joy set before him? Heaven. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Because he was able to look past the temporary pain, agony, difficulty, he was able to endure it. And that's the same thing that's going to happen for you and me. The, the only reason that I'm going to be able to, to remain faithful, the only reason that I'm going to be able to continue to put one step in front of the other in this endurance race that is Christianity, in this life that is difficult, is because I'm going to look beyond the here and now to my heavenly home. And because I have a home in heaven, I'll be willing to endure whatever difficulty may come this way. That may be whatever I have to give up that would make my life easier, that is contrary to God's will, or that may mean things that I have to go through that will, be, that will make my life more difficult because I am a Christian, because I want to have that heavenly home. 
I'm going to be willing to endure and go through those things. Go to chapter 4. Here, as he begins to, to wrap up the, the last part of, of Philippians, he says, Therefore, because of this hope of heaven, because of this change that's going to take place one day for, for all people, we're going to go from spirit, physical, physical beings to spiritual beings, and, and those of us who are Christians, that's going to be a, a fantastic transformation. For people, for people who aren't Christians, not so great. Terrible, horrible, horrific. Worst thing ever. But for those of us who are Christians, when we change from the physical from the perishable to the imperishable to the spiritual, it's going to be the best thing that's ever happened to us. Why? Because we'll be in heaven. Because the sadness of this life, because the difficulty of this life, because the illness of this life, because the tears of this life will be no more. And there will be this spiritual reality that we live in as Christians, if you're a Christian, with God and His love eternally, forever and ever and ever. Therefore, chapter 4, verse 1, My beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and my crown, in this way, with this hope, with this mindset, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. In verses 2 and 3, he encourages uh, the, them to, to, to live in harmony, especially two specific lady, ladies. And then in verse 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Remember what he said in chapter 3, verse 1? What does he say? Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same thing again is no trouble for me. And then he does that very thing in chapter 4. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say it, rejoice. He says, it's no problem for me. Look, I'll, I'll say it. I'll do it. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say, rejoice. Let your gentle spirit, verse 5, be known to all men. The Lord is near. Verse 6, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Let me draw your attention back to the, the parable of the sower that we talked about last week. One of the types of soil was a soil that had thorns in it. And what do those thorns do? They choke out the Word of God. They choke out the gospel. They choke out God's influence in our lives. That's what, again, I think Paul is talking about in chapter 4 and verse 6. Be anxious for nothing. Anxiety, worry, and why do we have anxiety and worry? Because we look at our own physical ability and we say, there's no way I can do this. And we're right. There's no way you can be exactly who God wants you to be by yourself. Only through the grace of God, the sacrifice of Jesus, and His shed blood can you be who God wants you to be. Only through our obedience to God, through our faith, can we be who God wants us to be? But as Christians, we don't have to worry about things anymore. Because while we still have to do our part, and we still have to do our best, we recognize that everything's not on us. We can depend on God to be there for us. Let me read verses 6 and 7 again, put these two things together, because verse 7 is what we all want. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Okay, Paul, why? Why should I do that? And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Why, why do we need to not be anxious, but instead prayer and, and, and pray and, and tell God what we want and be thankful for what God has given to us and, and, and trust that God will take care of us? Because when we do that, and only when we do that, do we have the peace that doesn't make sense. The peace that the world looks at and says, how can, you, how can you have this peace about you with all the things that are going on in your life? How can you have this peace about you when you just lost your job or when you just lost a loved one or when you've just done this or all of these things are happening to you? How can, how can you have this peace about you? When we fully rely on God in our lives and trust that He will do everything that He promises that He will do in Scripture, then we can, we can have a peace that the world will say that doesn't make sense. It surpasses all comprehension. How do we do that? Last point, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and any, if, if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Another version may say, or a better rendering of the, the language may say, ponder these things. Think about these things. For those of us who, who are Christians, 
If you go back to the first passage that we talked about in Mark chapter 4, or excuse me, Luke chapter 14, uh, there's a, the, the picture there where, uh, you know, he, he says to start with, if you want to be my follower, you've got to forsake everything else, even your family, if they get in the way. And then he, he tells this, this kind of parable. He says, for, for what man among, among you would, would calculate the cost to see if he has enough money, enough resources to, to build this tower that he wants to build? Because if you, if you start to build a tower and you, and you run out of resources and you get a, a, a tower that's half way done or even three quarters of the way done, people are going to look at you and say, that was foolish. That wasn't very smart. Now, now listen, I, I don't know when you became a Christian if you knew everything there was to be about being a Christian. Probably not. You, you might not have known just how difficult sometimes it is to be a Christian. Hopefully you, you knew the things that you needed to know. You, you named Jesus as your Lord. You wanted to, to recognize Him as the, the ruler of your life. But you may not have understood everything that that meant. So here you are. You're a Christian. You've been a Christian for a decade. You've been a Christian for, for five days. You're a Christian. You signed up for this. You've made this commitment. You have obeyed the gospel plan of salvation. You've put Christ on in baptism. You have said, you are my Lord. You are my Savior. I'll do whatever you want me to do, God. But then things start to happen and, and, and difficulty comes. Again, like the soil uh, that didn't have many roots. Uh, and, and the difficulties come and you get scorched out and burned out. But you're here. You're here now. Most of us here tonight, 99% of us in this room are Christians. What are you going to do when things get difficult? You've got to grow in your trust of God. And one of the ways you're going to do that is what Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8 says. When you find something that is good, when you find something that is godly, something that is right, something that is lovely, something that is, is of good repute, something that's worthy of your time to, to think about and to dwell on, stop. And think about it. And focus on it. And consider, what does that mean in my life? The most blatant example of that is Scripture. It's good. It's lovely. It's of good repute. It's a beautiful thing. If you want to know how God wants you to live your life, praise God He's given it to us. Stop. And ponder. Think about. And dwell on. Not just reading it. But what does that mean in my life? What do I do with that? Because as we study God's Word, we will only grow to trust God more and more. And as we grow to trust God more and more, then the difficulties of life will become easier to experience. Brothers and sisters, I, I know that a lot of us tonight, in a lot of various ways, have some sort of difficulty in our life right now. And maybe that's testing your faith. Know that God is there. Remember, that's, that's, what, Philippians two, that's what Philippians said as well. The Lord is near. I think about it this way. As, as those folks are, are running those, uh, those marathons, those triathlons, they're swimming, they're biking, they're running. What if they had somebody right beside them? Their partner. Someone to help them. Someone to encourage them. Someone to, to even carry them sometimes. That's what God does for us. He's there for us. He, he wants us to succeed. And He'll do everything in His power if we will simply strive to follow Him. What's the first step? In that, in that what's the, the first time for the tri the person who's doing the triathlon, what's the, what's the leap into the water to do the 2.4 miles? Uh, for someone who runs a marathon, what's the first step past the starting line? It's becoming a Christian. If you haven't become a Christian yet, then, then you're not on the journey yet. You're on a journey, uh, but you're not on the straight and narrow. You're on the wide path that leads to destruction. How do you become a Christian? And there's some of us here tonight that haven't become Christians yet uh, for various reasons. Let's, let's remind us uh, of what we need to do just to become a Christian. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, uh, The one who comes to, without faith, it is impossible to please God, because the one who comes to God must believe that He is, that God exists, and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Do you believe in God? Do you believe that, that God is real? Uh, do you believe that Jesus Christ is a resurrected Son of God? That's another thing that we have to confess with our mouths. Uh, the book of Romans chapter 10 tells us that if we confess Him as our Lord and, and believe that He resurrected from the grave, then, then we can have salvation. Uh, so, so belief and uh, repentance to, to try and do things His way. 
Uh, Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31, these are verses that you're familiar with, verses that I quote often, but uh, Acts 17, 30 and 31 says that, that God has overlooked the times of ignorance, but now has declared to all people everywhere that we must repent. And why must we repent? Because one day we'll all be judged. That's what chapter, verse 31 tells us. Uh, because all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, we've all messed up, we've all done the wrong thing. Tonight, if you're not a Christian, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the resurrected Son of God? Are you willing to confess that with your mouth and begin through repentance to show that with your actions? If so, then you can be baptized tonight. And there's back behind me uh, for some of our visitors. You may not know that back behind this screen and back behind this wooden lattice, there's a, there's a big tub of water. That's all it is. It's just a big tub of water. Until a believing, repentant, person confesses their belief in God, names Jesus as their Lord, and then that, that water becomes something different. Not physically. There's no magic in it. But as we appeal to God for a clean conscience through our baptism, and we reenact the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then His blood comes in contact with our sin and removes it completely. That's the first step. That's how you jump into the water. That's how you take that first step past the starting line. And it won't be easy. And if anybody's ever told you before that it's easy to be a Christian, they were either wrong or lying. It's not easy. So why do it? Jesus endured the cross for the joy set before Him. We can endure this life for the joy set before us. There is a heaven. It's where I want to go. So I'll do what it takes to get there. How about you? If you have any needs tonight, we invite you to come as we stand and sing.